Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by a very good friend of mine, Dr. Brian Dietrich, a professor of English and poet, superhero aficionado, uh, and basically badass intellectual. So I thought, Brian, I thought we would get together today to have a chat about superheroes, in, in particular, uh, how our modern conception of superheroes, what it is like, because we see so much about like the MCU, uh, the DC cinematic universe, uh, yeah. all of these different superhero TV shows that they're, they're doing something different from say like the golden age and the silver age. And we can, we can talk about aspects of that. And then I wanted to talk about some of the stuff that you've actually written uh, using superheroes as a frame. So how, do, how does that suit you? That sounds fantastic. Um, um, so first things first, how are you doing today? You doing well? I am doing exceedingly well. <laughs> We've moved into our new house and, and things are not quite finished yet, but we have a lake, we have a beach. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very glad to tear you away from all of that, just so we can sit and geek and nerd out about superheroes. Um, so the, the, you know superheroes better than I do. Like you're you're much more uh, immersed in like the the history and and the mythologies that have built up around them. So why why don't you start us off with like, talking about the conception of superheroes? Well, they 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 come out of the same era that provides us with pulp fiction, and I'm not talking necessarily at all about the film. Pulp Fiction, I'm talking about actual Pulp Fiction. Um, so they come out of that, um, that those, those years of World War II when the, the world is, is falling apart. Um, we, we, we get, um, you know, we, we've been introduced to existentialism. We, we, we're, we're beginning to see um, a reliance on It's, it's kind of a comforting idea that the hero, this is gonna sound strange, but the hero is fallible. Um, it, it, it helps define the era. So you, you get these, these detectives who are, who are as broken as the world. Um, they, 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 they simply don't arrive at answers in the way that, say, a Sherlock Holmes or a Hercule Poirot or an Auguste Dupont would, would have would have found, they 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 just don't find answers. In fact, in most of these detective stories, whether it's Raymond Chandler or, or whoever, um, Mickey Spillane, there's this idea that when they're done, the world is actually more broken than when they started. Um, and 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 the superhero figure is kind of an answer to that, uh, an alternative. Uh, and, and, and so we, we get a few heroes that, that, that started out, but it all shifts in 38 with the creation of Superman. And you've got these two young uh, Jewish writers who see what's happening in Europe and they don't want a broken detective uh, high on alcohol or drugs or whatever. They want a real Moses. They, they, they want a savior. And so they, they, they always talked about recreating Hercules, but what they really do is recreate Moses. And, and they give hope to what's happening because they, they, they see it uh, as a lot of people did, what's what's happening in in Europe with with Hitler and the rise of fascism in general, and they they want an answer to that, and so they 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 create this metahuman with the well, I would say with the cape, but the cape comes later, uh, but but the spandex is right there at the beginning, so this guy in spandex who can leap very high, you know the. The cape comes later, the flying comes later, the x-ray vision, the super breath, all of that begins to arrive in subsequent years 
when uh, DC and and um, what is it, Fawcett Comics are are battling over their two figures, Superman and Captain Marvel, who we now call Shazam because of copyright issues, but. Uh, but these two figures begin, you know, one gets a cape, so the other gets a cape. And so then this one gets supervision, so this one gets supervision, and, and on and on. But we begin with this character who has these, these super attributes who can who can frankly save the world. And, and it's very quickly followed by then, so that's 38, Batman and 39, Wonder Woman of 41, and along the way, a bunch of other caped crusaders, right? And they and they begin arriving in in in, in droves. Um, and they're all there to help us. And that lasts for quite a while. We call it the golden age. And then, um, and I'm not completely happy with these terms because I, I think there's a, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. But, but we move from the golden age to the silver age around 1956. It's easier just to say 1960. But around 1956, when in particular Marvel goes in and, and, and DC as well, they begin changing their heroes. And we move from, in many cases, supernatural origined heroes to science heroes. Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to get to the moon. We're trying to have answers to the Soviet Union. There's there, there are all of these things that that you know, science becomes the, the, the it idea child. And so, so Green Lantern goes from, from being a, an occult hero to an alien cop. And Hawkman and Hawkwoman, they go from being occult heroes to alien cops. And Flash goes from being a reincarnation of Hermes to, um, well, a scientist who gets hit by lightning and splashed with with liquid um, in his laboratory and he changes and the Hulk becomes the Hulk because of, I mean, you have the werewolf story going way, way back before any of this, uh, maybe to the origins of, of storytelling itself. But with the Hulk, we we now have a werewolf who changes originally at the full of the moon because of the science experiment got well i mean he's out there trying to save somebody from a bomb but but he gets irradiated with gamma rays what, whatever those are and so so on and on these heroes all move into the realm of science but there's still scientists or science based origins of heroes that are here to help us with our science problems our our world problems putting the world back together answering the questions that can still be answered. It's right around um, uh, the late 60s, early 70s, we see another subtle shift that's going to snowball in the 80s. And that's where we move from silver to what a lot of people, here's where I get pissed off, what people call the Bronze Age. Um, I don't think it's less, um, which bronze would suggest. Uh, I think it's the platinum era. And I, and I think those heroes that come out of the 80s are actually far better than those that preceded. But anyway, um, and what begins to happen there, particularly with the, the, that story of, of Spider-Man dealing with drugs and drug dealers and prostitution and, and, and organized crime, reality finally seeps in to the superhero story. And, and, and honestly, those heroes become the heroes that originated superheroes to begin with. And so now we start getting broken anti-heroes like we saw in the original Pulps. So we've, we've sort of come full circle. Mm -hmm. and, and that, in my mind, that begins with, um, uh, American flag, uh, Chaikin's American flag, and with Doug Munch's um, The uh, uh, Moon Knight. A lot of others will say it starts with, with um, 
uh, Batman in, in um, Dark Knight Returns and with Watchmen and with Mouse and with uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, all of those that, that hit in, in and around 1985, 1986. And while that's true, there's this, this great influx, particularly of, of British writers. Um, it's the, it's the, the British invasion comic book style. Um, that's, that's the major shift of our era out, you know, those of us now still alive. Um, that's, yes, there are others still alive. You might want to cut that part out. Uh, <laughs> but but right around there, we're beginning to see post-Nixon, uh, post-Watergate, post-assassinations, um, a, a real turn toward high realism, high mimetic mode yep. of storytelling. And, and these heroes, when you, whether it's, it's Batman in, in uh, Dark Knight, um, he's, um, he's literally broken, he's old, and he's, he's called out of retirement to face these, these, these th street thugs uh, who, who have become mutants. Um, we, we have, um, well, we, we have the, the, the mutants, we, you know, the, the X-Men come out of this, this same era, but, but uh, Moon Knight, every single character he fights, it's not, you know, Batman, all of his major nemeses are um, insane people. Um, the, 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 which is why they all go to Arkham Asylum. It's not like they go to maximum security prison, they go to a crazy house. Um, but Moon Knight is actually fighting every one of his major nemeses are, are serial killers. And, and, and they're, they're, they don't have quick gimmicks. They don't, they don't you know, wear makeup. They're just, they're just, can I say fucking nuts? Um, they're, just, they're just crazy. And uh, on, on a scale that, that honestly, I believe outstrips even someone like the Joker, although the Joker gets ramped up too in things like The Killing Joke. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and in particular, another one of these comics that hits right around 86, 87, I can't remember the year, um, Arkham Asylum, which, which that and Watchmen may be the great graphic novels of, of all time. Superman Red Sun, a little later, uh, might also be one of those. But um, so we, we have the, the golden age, silver age, I'm gonna call it platinum age. Um, now we've entered the, the cinematic age and um, it's now, a, a, in some ways it was an attempt to turn back the clock go back to the golden age and, and, and revivify the, uh, what the uh, surety that things can be answered, that heroes can be heroes. Uh, and it starts with Spider-Man uh, in 2002, right oh, Hang after. on a sec, no, hang on a sec. What about Michael Keaton's Batman? Um, that he still falls into that category. And yes, it was the, the largest money maker of all time it makes it's the, i think the first film to make a billion dollars but it falls into that same category and and it doesn't create a, a wave of other superhero films but it, the, the thing try, it doesn't work it's not until spider-man that it that it takes off and because, suddenly it's everywhere because the reason i bring that up is um because obviously like the, the first r-rated superhero film was blade with wesley snipes yes but yes they, but, it, but it it fell away and and hardly anyone went to see it uh, uh compared to this say the most recent spider-man i mean th these these films are they're ever they're everywhere it's every part of our culture it's every movie in the theaters it's all over our television sets it's it's everywhere except the comic book shops which are dying yeah because if you think like christopher reeve as Superman was that very, very golden age because he's he's an aw shucks ma'am as Clark Kent. And then he's the with the, the little kiss curl 
the perfect paragon of virtue. And, you know, the modern audience looking at that is doesn't believe it because he's not dirty enough. He doesn't have enough dirt under his fingernails. He's not gritty. So we had the Superman. So everyone, so everyone called for that. Then when we got it with Superman, Man of Steel, the, the fanboys everywhere went apeshit. So, you know, we, we, we struggle with these things. And when I say we, that's the problem, right? We're talking about global culture and there really is no we. So, but, but what the, was interesting was friends. Yeah, but they desire this and they get something else and they're not happy about it. But overall, I think we tried with Spider-Man and others when the, when the cinematic era hit, they, there's this attempt to, to, to revivify the, the, the aw shucks hero. Yeah, because the, and the reason I brought up um, Michael Keaton's Batman, because uh, the first one had, uh, it was clearly a comic book movie. Like it, it had that Gothic feel to Gotham, that it didn't feel like quite a real city. But there was an element of a sort of uh, back alley, New Jersey, New York kind of feel to it. That it was kind of evoking that. And there was a, a small, tiny element of mimesis uh, sort of worked yeah. into it. But it was very clearly comic booky. And then when we get to the sequel to that, um, it one of the great superhero films of all time, Batman but, Returns. But it goes it goes more comic booky rather than more realistic. I would, I would disagree, but go ahead. Go. Well, I, oh, come on. Uh, the penguin coughing up black fluid and being wheeled out at the end by giant penguins and the penguins with their rockets on their back. Like this is all very comic booky. And even the it's architecture. Very solid, I, I would say it's very Salvador Dali. I mean, it, it's, it's surreal. Okay, uh, but it's still it's still agreed. It is still that brokenness, right? I mean, this yeah. this is a terrible. I mean, Batman actually has a conversation on the couch with Catwoman about his own schizophrenia, right? So, I mean, this this wouldn't have happened if it well if it weren't for Dark Knight Returns, the the comic. Yeah. Um. So so there's character wise, there's a reality that sets in. Visually, I agree that it's it's outside the realm of the normal, but that again, that's also part of what it makes it a super gothic film, uh, as opposed to even just a gothic film. Yeah. Uh, and it's a it's a surreal experience that that we've never seen and maybe haven't seen since, um, which is one of the reasons why I adore it so much is because it's so freaking weird. But, but beautiful. I mean, it begins okay. as, a, as a retelling of the story of, of uh, Phantom of the Opera uh, and then and then and then gets strange from there. <laughs> <laughs> from that from that very normal starting point. But yeah. what's maybe weird... born with flippers set in a cage who eats the cat. That's how it starts. <laughs> but what, what I find really weird about that particular franchise arc is you started with Batman, then Batman returns. And then sort of Joel Schumacher comes in and it gets visually very, very weird. And it suddenly goes back to that camp aesthetic of um, the uh, Adam, Adam West. Yes. The, the Adam West, like almost with the, the pie yeah. and the, the, it gets so with, strange. With, with the, the neon paint and the, and the, the glow in the dark hockey players and um Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze I mean who chose that and Batman has nipples and now Batman can fly on us in, in in the air on a surfboard and it, Schumacher single-handedly killed the, the the rebirth of the superhero genre in film and it it, it didn't come back until Spider-Man and then it and then it hit its stride with Christopher Nolan's Batman you know, I mean, we, we could we could sort of look at the cinematic age of of, of superheroes just through the eyes of Batman. Yeah. Um, and, but what I find really interesting stages. is is when and I know Blade was not a massive critical success or even box office success. But, no, but it's also brilliant until the last five minutes. Yeah. But the aesthetic of Blade 
which was very grounded in reality, we see suddenly that that they go, right, can we do that grounding in reality, but maybe make it a bit brighter? Uh, and that's that's where we get the sort of the modern day re retelling of Spider-Man, because it is it's in almost our world and it is has that grounding in the the visual reality. Um, well, it, it, it begins with a, a blood rave and a guy getting a blow job in a in a in the back of a of a a meat packing plant. Um, it's it, with with a porn star playing the role of the the first vampire we see. I mean, it's talk about grounded in reality. I mean, this is about as as gritty as it gets. Well, um, it, it, and I, I have nothing but respect for Blade. I think it's 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 an extraordinary film, and it and it and it actually deals with race in a in a wonderful way. Um, the 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 you know you've got the vampire calling Blade and Uncle Tom um, because he's he's trying to live in both worlds, and and so we we have this internal struggle of what it means to be a real vampire a full vampire and that and that plays into ideas of identity and and because they even uh, talk about the diff identification the but the, the difference between a pure blood and someone who has merely yes. been turned and yes. that whole hierarchy and yeah, there's yeah. so many really interesting things in that film yeah. but you know it, it had great action set pieces it had a, a very definitive gritty dark uh, but splashes of red all the way through it aesthetic well it's and, it's, it's certainly a far better film than 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 the spider-man films but spider-man hit at the perfect time spider-man came out right after 9 11. they even had to airbrush out in the in the advertisement posters the images of the, the twin towers um but New York was looking, the world was looking, America in particular was looking for a hero again. And I mean, not only do we get one in Spider-Man, but by the time you get to the, the better film, Spider-Man 2, um, you have him save the train. And if you go back and watch that scene, he's, he's splayed Christ. out like this. And, and then he falls backward and the, the, the people he has saved pull him into the, the train car and, and they carry him back like the Pieta. And, the, and, and then they, they, and we have this image of, you know, human or not human, savior or grounded in reality because he's lost his mask. And then they're all, well, we won't, we won't tell anyone, you know, the little boy, uh, or we won't tell no one. Um, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous Christ, scene that 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 carries through that whole you know that even the scene toward the end when he's holding the wall trying to keep mary jane safe and this is very heavy you know this load that he's carrying he might as well be carrying the cross to golgotha um so yeah it's a it it it, it answered a call for the hero in a way that then just exploded and now suddenly everything turned and it's not just superhero film superhero television everything shifted so what we used to see on tv moved to the big screen and what we used to see on the big screen screen had to move to tv to to, to have a place to go um, and so now we have the golden age of television uh, for the first time i mean really great stuff while our our cinemas are full of well, I, I like superhero stories very, very much, but a lot of it's crap, to be honest. And entertaining crap. Um, but and yes, sometimes yes. sometimes that's what you want. But it, and sometimes it's transcendent. So we still are getting on occasion the the the, the Batman returns and 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 the blade kind of things. Um and I'm kind of afraid to say this, but sometimes we get uh, Ang Lee's Hulk and, and it transcends what our expectations are. Uh, so much so that it's become a lightning rod for discussion. You've got to, it's about 50-50 split on whether it's one of the greatest superhero films or one of the worst. Um, I'm, and weirdly enough, 
to be greatest. We we've talked about this before because one of the like, I on the whole, I'm not a huge fan of Ang Lee's Hulk, and because we've talked about this, you know this. Yeah. But which is what I was afraid to bring it. <laughs> no, Brian, we we argue about this stuff all the time, and you know yes. it, and yes. you know course, that. Please. We're supposed to. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're friends. But uh, the way that Ang Lee used the comic book framing um, for uh, scene transitions and was bringing that actually into frame and was integrating that into the cinematic experience, I thought was incredibly clever. And it was a really interesting visual way to represent the origins of it of uh, as the, the, a... Sorry. No, no, okay, you've interrupted, you carry on. The, 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 I just quickly, the greatest editing of any film I, I know of. I mean, because every single edit is doing a different thing narratively. And, and movies don't do that. You know, you have a, just a, a fade or a, an iris or a swipe just because. But, but in Hulk, if you go back and watch the film very closely and slowly every single edit has the way it's edited has a particular purpose that is grounded in what's happening either within or outside the characters it's it's extraordinary sorry go and ahead. I, but i was about to say because of how he does that it reminded me very much of uh, the control and cleverness that uh Moor had in watchmen and how uh, Moore was actually using the structure of the comic book page and the structure of the panels to tell the story. So uh, the, the famously, the, the, when the comedian falls, is thrown out the window at the start and he falls down through the panels. And then at the end, we see the blood, you know, going into the gutter. And the thing is, that means he is he's still alive here. And then he's dead here, which means that the reader has killed the comedian in the gutter, this, the white space between the frames. And you go, it is so well done. And it's the, that knowledge of how the structure of a comic book page works. And like Ang Lee replicates that. And I, I have enormous respect for it. I just didn't enjoy aspects of the actual story, which is a, is a different thing. Cause we, we can balance between things that we enjoy in terms of preference and enjoyment and also respect for the filmmaking craft. And I'm, I'm not a film expert, but um, Ang Lee's Hulk was, was fascinating. Um, I'm gonna come back to Hulk in a second, but, but for just a second on, on Watchmen, the, uh, and I'm drawing a complete blank on the artist. Um, Dave Gibbons? Dave Gibbons, thank you. So Gibbons um, originally drew, you know, that 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 happy face button, which plays such an important role at the very outset when the comedian hits the ground. Um, and he decided, for whatever reason, and I've seen interviews written a lengthy article about this, but he um, he decided to repeat that image of the of the smiley face um at once and and more found it very interesting and then he did it again and again and now so if you go and you read this graphic novel which of course originally was 12 individual comics and then mm -hmm. compiled into a graphic novel um that imagery appears over 200 times um in the, in the course of the overall story and in extraordinary ways again very much like ang lee is trying to do with the with the editing uh and certain symbols i mean you've got the, the in in hulk you've got the symbol of the of the uh of the fungus mm -hmm. that, that keeps reappearing this and, and parasites and um this idea of one thing feeding off of another which becomes this metaphor for the the the, the rage and the the internal turmoil that that is feeding the rage of the hulk um, and feeding the rage of the Hulk's father, and 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 just and this this idea of where 
the origin of the hero arrives from, but also the origin of the villain in every person. Um, and, and, the, and the symbols, which get, they get ridiculous at a certain point with the, the, the mutant poodle, for example, but, but, but the kid, the, the, the child uh, banner is, it has two toys. And, and one is a reptile, it's a, it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and the other is, is a dog. And, and there, it's, so this, this image of, of, the, of the reptilian versus the mammalian mm -hmm. brain, right? The, the, the R complex, the, 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 the base of the brain where our, our, our competitiveness and, and rage come from. And then the, the, the frontal lobe, which is where our compassion and, and understanding and, and, and intellect come from, that's, that's symbolized in the boy playing with these two things. But then that repeats with the green Hulk, very reptilian, fighting, God help us all, giant mutant dogs. <laughs> um, so yes, yes, it's, it's a bad choice. <laughs> but if, but you, you know, and, but are even just not things, scary. They're dumb. Yeah, but like even that dichotomy, that uh, splitting of it. You know, that's the strange case of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. That we that yes. that yes. splitting of uh, humanity into the uh, ostensible sort of uh, civilized versus savage. Like this, this is a repeating motif throughout literature. Um, so, so I, I I love Ang Lee's attempt. The result, at least in one part of the film, is, I mean, everything has its greatness and its great failure. <laughs> and the mutant poodle is, is a great failure. But, but it's still an attempt to create this, this wonderful visual metaphor that carries you through. And so the same thing happens in Watchmen with the, with the, the, the smiley face, because it shows up in so many ways, not the least of which in the Galley Crater on Mars you know, which, which exists. It, it's, know, and that's the weird thing. That's a real looks, thing. Yes. It looks like a giant happy face. Um, and, and at the same time that this was happening, there actually was a serial killer or a serial bomber, I suppose, uh, at work in the U S and he was trying to create with his different bombings across the United States. He was trying to draw visually from above if you looked at a map a giant smiley face so this all plays into what they're doing in the story and it it shows up in hundreds of different ways um, in in um, the electrical car outlets in the uh, uh, image on a on a on a jack-o-lantern on 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 the wall and blood spatter and just in so many in in reflections in water on a on an alleyway it's just everywhere and so they're doing something visually that really rarely happens in comics that that it delves deep into the literary as opposed to just the 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 the, the pulp storytelling they they've 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 trajected off into something well that that more is great at which is and, 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 and Gibbons just really telling a great literary story. It just so happens that it's visual. Yeah. But it, because it, it was interesting when you had mentioned that the British invasion, you know, like uh, uh, Frank Miller, Alan Moore, uh, slightly later on, Neil Gaiman. Um, but a lot of that, that those, uh, authors, writers, comic book artists that, that were coming across, the, the impact of 2000 AD on them, which was a much darker comic than a, a lot of the yeah. American comics, because it, it was drawing from the horror tradition a lot of the time, and yeah. horror and science fiction, rather than the, the slightly more, at, at times, uh, overly patriotic, almost jingoistic or, or propagandist, uh, elements that had been in superhero stories because of the world war ii sort of origins that these were stirring positive things whereas you know when when you get that horror tradition filtering in when you get uh, anti-heroes like judge dread 
which, you know, the more fascistic Dredd became, the more popular he became. Like, it was a very bizarre thing. And we see that in, in the era of, towards the end of the 70s, the, the beginning of the 80s, uh, that Reagan-Thatcherite era of uh, a lot of depression, and but the rise of the yuppie. And, well, an, an, another, pheno- well, all of more is phenomenal, except for maybe Necronomicon, but um, V for Vendetta. I mean, it is specifically about Thatcher and Thatcherism. I mean, he he says at the in the introduction to the the compiled um, uh, graphic novel V for Vendetta, the very beginning, he says, "I'm I'm leaving Britain. It's dark and it's scary, and I don't want to live here anymore." And, you know, it, it, you've got the Black Mariahs picking people up off the street. You've got, you know, this, this admittedly over-painted version, a comic book version of Thatcherism that's grown into full-blown fascism. But he, he's, he's terrified that it's, that it's happening here. And he's terrified that it's happening in America because that's exact. I mean, the, the, the main villain in Watchmen is not Ozymandias. The, the, the villain is Ronald Reagan. <laughs> you know, the, the villain in Dark Knight Returns is the, the comic is Ronald Reagan um, and, and eventually Superman. The, the hero becomes Batman when he, he, he tries to kill Superman. And then has to, you know, fake his own death. And um, but this then sort of takes us on to you know it, um, Superman Red Sun, which I think is a, a brilliant uh, graphic yeah. novel. It's one of my my favorites. But yeah. in it again, it's destabilizing the notion of hero, because you know we follow along, you know, with this what if story. And it's Superman and, he, you know, you're following along and you think, yeah, he's doing the right thing. Oh, yeah, he's doing that. And you can understand his reasons. And then Batman comes in essentially as a terrorist. And yes. we see Lex Luthor, who we are conditioned to think of as a bad guy. And yet, because of their introduction, to the story, it starts calling into question the narrative. It destabilizes the notion of hero. It destabilizes the notion of narrative perspective always resting with the hero. And, and the notion of villain, right? Both the hero and villain are deconstructed to where they somehow, they meet in the middle narratively, but they also meet in the middle biologically. Uh, spoiler alert, right? Luther, it turns out, is the ancestor of what will become the line of the House of L which will lead to Superman coming back in time and becoming Superman and fighting his great, 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 great grandfather. Right. So it's, it's this extraordinary undercutting deconstruction, dismantling of hero and villain and history and what we think. I mean, because, because Luther really is a bad guy in many parts of the book, but he's, doing bad things in order to save the world from the, in this case, Uberman, right? Uh, and and man, of, man of iron as opposed to man of steel. Well, he's a and defender of the Warsaw know, Pact. Yes, right, right. So, so for those who don't know, the, the, the premise of the story is, before you get to the end, is basically that Superman, uh, what if Superman arrived on Earth a few minutes later and ended up in the Ukraine instead of Kansas and was raised in um, the the era of the rise of of, of Russia. Well, uh, well, the so, USSR. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not it's not as critical of um, communism as you would expect, even in a story like this, primarily because the author is himself a socialist. And so, so he's he is critiquing socialism, but not condemning it. Well, and also there's a difference between socialism and communism. Yes, of course, of course. But 
see the one of the, and this is what I wanted to talk about in this superheroes while we, we we were thinking in those grand sort of terms of like golden age silver age and these big movements there has been for a long time a whole sequence of comic books that have been playing with the notion of what is a hero what is an anti-hero what is a villain they have been deconstructing and, and taking it all apart uh, playing deliberately into sort of like the the um sexual deviancy of heroes like a lot of the early wonder woman stuff about bondage and all of those things that were worked into it that become more explicitly explored uh and moore obviously does that a lot you were going to say you've you've opened up a huge pandora's box <laughs> with wonder woman oh okay um, well well why don't we stick a pin in the Wonder Woman discussion for a minute, okay. just so I can... So in the history of comic books and in the history of all of these sorts of things, there's always been this sort of tension between the paragon and the flawed hero and deconstructing and the, the conversation between these things. And we see movements, uh, micro trends, larger trends. But I think it's only now that we're seeing a lot of that come into the mainstream sort of TV and film adaptations. And that I think is a very interesting because yeah. this has been going on in comic books for a long time. Like when, yeah. when you look at Doom Patrol as sort of like the very broken version almost of the X-Men, the X-Men seem glossy and superhero. And yeah. then you have Doom Patrol, which is a lot more subversive and yeah. I, getting into these very broken and, and strange stories uh, um, that, x-men sort of tangentially sort of almost yeah. touches on the the only comic i i really assiduously collected as a kid was x-men but my favorite was always doom patrol as a as a group my favorite hero individual was moon knight both of them because they were far more broken than anybody else anywhere I mean, the characters of Doom Patrol are a broken robot and a guy with no face. And, and, and I mean, it's just, it's, yes, it's, you know, X-Men sort of, tra you know, stole from that. Um, they stole from each other. They, you know, comics consistently are borrowing from one another, stealing from one, plagiarizing one another, if you will. Um, but, but Doom Patrol caught my heart in a way that X-Men didn't i just collected x-men because it was so easy so much easier um and and i i really did like the the, the cochran art and then eventually the john byrne art which just i fell in love with um but as far as a single character it was it was always moon knight because it it was so dark and it was i mean moon knight is marvel's version of batman and except that the, the implication of Batman having multiple personalities is only implied in Batman until you get to some of the later iterations. It's, it's Moon Knight that it's, it's explicit that he has yeah. multiple personality disorder or I guess uh, dissociative identity disorder, we say now. Um, and I can't tell you how excited I am for the series coming and it starts in March. And I'm just like, oh yes um and of course i'll be disappointed but you know maybe not we'll see um but i i i love these characters that are that are really human precisely because they are the most broken of us and and that's where these stories shine because they have so little light but if, it, it, if, it's 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 a it's a the paradox of the gothic that the gothic speaks and and that's you you mentioned horror horror informs that and it's also why batman is more popular will always be more popular than superman the shadow is far more far more interesting than the persona the id is more interesting than than the superego. We, we, we hate the superego because it's telling us what not to do. We love the id because it's willing to do what we, sh what we oughtn't 
do. But it, the, the, there was an interesting, do you remember uh, when they launched the Daredevil TV show and the Jessica Jones TV show? And regardless of- wonderful. But regardless of how the, the rest of the season went, season one of both Daredevil and Jessica Jones were absolutely stunning TV shows. They were broken heroes that uh, were fighting street level, um, very personal, down in the dirt in the alleyways kind of stories. Yeah. And they were wonderful articulations about the, the frailty of superheroes. And it, again, it was breaking apart the mythos of a superhero, giving it a different style of realism um, and making it feel very believable, giving it that texture that, of um, reality that you missed even in the Nolan Dark Knight films, that they, they were so cinematic, so glossy, that although they were dark, and gritty and Heath Ledger was amazing as the Joker. It yes. never had the same street level believability that Daredevil or Jessica Jones had. Because they didn't focus on Batman. Now, the Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker is perhaps the greatest portrayal of a hero or villain ever. Um, I mean, Heath Ledger doesn't even exist in that film. It's the Joker. There's, there's just, there's no sense. I, I've watched that film over and over and over, and I, I just can't see Heath Ledger there at all. He's just, he just vanishes, and the Joker is, 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 is real, um, and it has to do with his brokenness. Batman. We don't, we don't really. The story isn't really about him. Well, um, and the, that the has first been a problem. Film is more about Ra's al Ghul than it is Batman. The second film is more about Joker than it is about him. The third film is more about Bane than it is about him, and and he just kind of fades to the background. And 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 that's a choice, and I I, I've, I find it interesting, but but we don't really get the Batman story. Um, what we get are these these villain stories, which which are great. But that's one of the issues with a lot of the cinematic representations of Batman in that they tell the origin story repeatedly over and over again as if none of us have not already seen it about a bazillion times. Right. But once they've done that, they go, right, now we've established Batman. Let's focus on the villain. And Batman always ends up playing second fiddle to the villain in the story. His rogues gallery is the focus of all of these different stories. It's like, what is the Joker up to this time? What is the Riddler up to this time? Except for the, the, the two graphic novels that, that I've mentioned, the, the, the original uh, Batman Dark Knight Returns really focuses on, well, a lot of things, but, but it, it really zeroes in on Batman as a person. Um, and then even more so, the graphic novel Arkham Asylum. That that may be the greatest Batman story ever told. I know a lot of people talk about the Killing Joke, which is really good, but I'm sorry, I, I think Arkham Asylum is is by far the, the the greatest Batman story ever told because it's all about Batman inside himself, and as he's inside the asylum, it becomes very clear that the villains are just facets of him, mm -hmm. of his own brokenness and his own predilections and fears and, and suppressed desires. And um, it's, it is a simply extraordinary tale um, about Batman. Now I have nothing against the stories about villains, but a lot of these films forget the hero, which again is, is fine and can be a choice, but but I also like the the hero stories, particularly when we see the hero challenged. But what I find interesting about a lot of the the modern sort of uh, films and um, TV shows is that quite often the the hero needs to have feet of clay for us to believe yeah. in them, um, and it, it's very very strange for me because villains then become a lot easier to create but if if you think of uh like in watchmen that the element of sexual deviancy that gets played into there 
and then you look at the boys uh the recent adaptation of garth ennis's it is yeah garth ennis's story um, yeah. which plays into superhero as celebrity as if they existed in the real world and the focus on sex and drugs and moral corruption and as, sexual deviancy oh good lord and and sexual but that's that's a major focus when we look at uh, if you take a much more family friendly show like superman and lois uh, on the, yes. the cw that's yes. again looking at a broken family dynamic and it's yeah. focused on the domestic because it's trying to ground Superman in the real world, make him less yeah. um, godlike because he has two stroppy teenagers. He yes. has uh, marital problems and it's trying to make him relatable as a oh shucks mom about town when, yeah, he's an alien with all of these superpowers. But again, trying to drag him down almost into the muck, just very different muck and, and not well, as it, filthy it, as the boys. And, and and dragging Lois into the same. I mean, she's she's amazing in the series. Hey, he's amazing. She's amazing. The boys are. It's it's a it's a really good show. And then and then of course we get um, the uh, I can't remember the the character's name. Anyway, we 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 have so many brilliant portrayals in that in that show um same thing with daredevil we we the, the 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 male roles the female roles um that first season as you mentioned is 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 brilliant there's an episode the second season i i actually haven't strangely i haven't seen the third season now i've been sort of saving it as a present for myself uh but the second season fails primarily because it becomes more of a superhero story just a typical yeah. But there is one episode, it's called the, the New York's Finest. I think it's episode two or three of the second season, which has this brilliant discussion between Daredevil and Punisher on a rooftop. And it, and it is this discussion that we're having now. What is a hero? What is the difference between a hero and a vigilante? And it's, 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 it's an amazing kind of story so those of you who, who teach this kind of stuff watch that scene use it in your class it's 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 it, it'll get discussion going like nothing you can imagine it's a wonderful moment when they're really talking about what it means to save the law by breaking the law to save the world by breaking it wide open but and again i it's weird thinking of but Garth Ennis is uh, the boys. Yeah. He grew up in very similar part of the world to me. And we didn't grow up with the same veneration for the mythos of going into the West and being a lawman and the, the outlaws and cowboys and those sorts of stories. We saw the Hollywood versions of those. Um, that it wasn't part of the national mythos here. But the, the idea of the vigilante, the, that idea has very different connotations in Northern Ireland. Yeah. But in, in American culture, and this is, is something that I sometimes sort of struggle to wrap my head around, the, the idea of these vigilantes going out and as, yes, I'm gonna protect the law by, and quite often extremely violent means, like think of the number of superhero films where essentially the villain is killed off at the end or where the superhero the good guy kills multiple nameless henchmen and foot soldiers that just executes them and they the power disparity between the hero character who has like whatever x technology or superpowers and they are just killing all of these people um who are bog standard humans that way if you flip the narrative perspective and thought about it from their point of view you go that superhero is a monster uh yeah and a couple of things here that, that a lot of the discussion about uh superman man of steel i don't want to get too deep into that but just just the ending when he kills zod um fandom, zod and the family fandom went nuts 
that 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 he would he would kill Zod, that he that Superman would kill somebody. Superman in the Donner version, in 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 the 70s, the 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 first big film extravaganza in Superman 2, both he and Lois kill. He kills Zod, she kills Zara. Uh, they, they they kick them into they, they strip their powers and kick them into the Arctic Ocean. That's death. That's they're gone. That's that's it. Um, so so it's happened before. It's not like this is the but, first time. And, and the other thing still... that you that you mentioned the 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 idea of, of the Western. The same trajectory of of building up the hero as a as a as a as an icon and then eventually deconstructing it as time goes along happened in the Western as well, yeah. because the, the, the most interesting Westerns come along with the spaghetti Westerns and, and Sergio Leone and, and uh, once upon a time in the West and, and the high plains drifter and uh, pale rider and these kind of things um, where, where, where we are no longer willing to see, particularly as the Vietnam era uh, begins a questioning of the American soul um, and the and the Nixon era. Um, suddenly, we begin questioning all our heroes. So it, it happens not in just in comics, but in many other storylines as well. That started earlier with the detective uh, storytelling, right around World War II. But it, it takes a while for that to trickle into the other heroic narratives. In America, and I imagine that the same thing must be happening and has been happening for far longer in in Ireland. Let's let's not get into the. Oh well, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, even in even in Yeats, right? I mean, he he, as as he begins writing his plays and poems, he he's trying to revivify Irish mythology, and 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 create something for yeah, his countrymen to, to, to revere again and remember but by the end he's he's he himself is deconstructing everything including himself and suddenly it's all about the rag and bone shop of the heart as opposed to the grand uh um journeys of of great irish heroes yeah but it, i mean even look at the uh, kathleen nahulahan that that short play that yeah. basic propaganda piece that was a recruitment tool um and yet I, I, even knowing that reading it i i still get like the hairs on the back of my neck standing on it that yitz was so good at manipulating that um and i think that you know we we see that in a lot of exceptionally good writing but i'm just i'm so fascinated by the fact that a lot of the very popular superhero stuff now is very much tied into creating these these broken stories and tearing heroes down and elevating quite often sociopaths like if you think of the boys the heroes the boys are sociopathic murderers yeah um <laughs> iron man like I, and I i've talked about this before but iron man uh with uh, robert downey jr playing tony stark like he's a sociopath who murders people yet he's just kind of lovable you go, he's a soci sociopathic, egomaniacal womanizer. He is not a hero. He's actually far from it when you look at his actual actions and not just what the story is telling you about it from his perspective, because he's very much the hero of his own story. But it, it's this fascinating dichotomy that we want heroes, but we can't accept them unless they are dirty and grubby and we tear them down and it, it just it seems so much easier villains seem to be so much easier and yet we see in the iron man movies that they never came up with a convincing villain in any of them <laughs> iron man 2 and again i'm going to be controversial here whiplash is extraordinary mickey of course mickey bork is an, an amazing actor and, and I, I i'm not sure about mickey rourke if he's 
redeemed himself, but he's he 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 plays a wonderful, crazy person who actually has a reason. But you see, this he, is what he, I would argue destroyed by commerce by by billionaires he's 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 not even a one percenter he's a he's a at best a a tenth of a percenter you know and 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 tony stark is far beyond the 99 percent. he's you know the the top well he's the richest person in the world really um and and so so there's i i find that it's it's the kind of thing that that Superman Red Sun is dealing with as well, the the the, the haves and the have nots. But you see, um, my issue, my issue with Iron Man 2 is that the the framing of it was absolutely brilliant, setting Mickey Rourke's character up, Whiplash up, as the the alternate Tony Stark. He's just as brilliant. Yes. He builds his own suit from bit parts. He yes. invents all of this stuff himself. And it, you know, you had Tony going through his his addiction and all of these sorts of things and the sins of the father. And yet about halfway through the movie, it turns into Vanko's the bad guy, Tony's the good guy, instead of recognizing that Vanko is a victim and Tony's an asshole. Fair enough. Fair enough. And that's my problem because he Vanko is not a villain until almost the very end when suddenly you're just told yeah, yeah he's just a bad guy and he's just going to do these things for no reason which is not what happens in say um watchman or v for vendetta we we recognize that in watchman the heroes are not heroes at all and if they're saving the world they may only be saving it for a few months or a few years I mean, the very last panel, the very last image of the book is the editor reaching for Rorschach's journal, which may blow the, the great lie that killed half of New York City in order to save the planet. It may blow it wide open and it, it go back to the same problem we had before. And, and, and so there's this, this real moral knife's edge that the characters walk at the end do we let the lie stand reveal it and and let the world end or do we keep the lie and allow those people to have died with no repercussion um what what, what do you do I, um, but and then and then v for vendetta you 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 come to realize of course that your hero is not at all he's he's a sadistic um megalomaniacal um <sighs> torturer and kidnapper and murderer and sociopath and you know all of these things now he's doing these things ostensibly to help save england but is that is that okay um, and and the, it, Moore is very incisive about coming back to that question again and again. What price will we pay? And, to and survive? that's the thing. Those stories ask the question. But what we see in, um, say, The Boys, the TV show, which again is very different. In terms of adaptation, is actually quite far away from the source material. But in that, it's yeah. very clear that the boys are meant to be the heroes and the soups are the bad guys you know yeah. it, it's made explicit but in a lot of the the comic books and a lot of the writing that we see in these great comic books it's asking the question about where is the line whereas in a lot of the filmic representations i think it gets overly simplified and it gets reduced down to this need that yes we still will have to have the good guys versus the bad guys. And it still ultimately comes down to that. I mean, even um, Jupiter's Legacy, which uh, I, I think you would have quite liked because of its the influence of Kong on it. Um, I thought that was actually a fascinating sort of breakdown again of this question because you had the, the principles of the earlier generation, which are now seen as very old fashioned by the newer heroes. Um, 
and the complexity of that very rigid mentality of no we must do it this way even at the cost of x and the new heroes go well, why don't we just kill them because then it's one less bad guy we just kill the bad guy he's not going to come back whereas if you just put him in prison he's going to break out again and kill people and we hear that argument all the time about batman why doesn't batman kill the joker why doesn't batman kill the riddler why does he because the joker keeps breaking out the riddler keeps and they keep killing people why doesn't batman just kill them and yeah. That question is is explored in a lot of the great Batman stories, but is very rarely explored in the film or or the sort of the cinematic versions. But that's what we saw explicitly explored in Jupiter's Legacy, and I think that that was a really interesting dynamic, um, and I think it was a a, a criminally uh, undervalued show. Well, this is one of the reasons why um, Help Blazer, the the uh, John Constantine story, will never be filmed in the way it sh should be. Um, although I'm 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 very fond of strangely the the Keanu Reeves version. Um, it was it was miscast uh terribly although he somehow manages to make it work for what it is it's just not john constantine that i that i know from the comics um the john constantine that i know from the comics is a guy who is haunted by both his victims and the victims of those who he has failed to deal with kill <laughs> um but he's also not against killing um, and he's not against doing whatever it takes. Um, and, and so he is, he's, he's, he is a bad, bad man. Um, but the, you can't, you can't really film that story. I mean, they get close to it, but as you say, like in Iron Man two, the, the, the storyline will flip or as in, uh, the boys um clearly they are doing terrible things um i mean shoving nitro up a man's ass so that you can blow him up because his skin is impenetrable um is a problem and i mean wow um <laughs> they do some horrible horrible things but yet they still try to make them lovable in the constant comics it's it's maybe impossible to see him as lovable you may admire him but you never love him because he's and he's a bad bastard um so you, you can't really film it and and there's a reason why they had to cast canu reeves to try to tell the story and then i didn't see much of the the tv version but it only lasted a few episodes and they canceled it um they just they just can't seem to get their head around really doing the anti-hero story fully in the way that the comics have yeah they, they get close but they they never get all the way there and, and again i think it's this they want the appearance of a morally complex character but what they really want is a hero who's a little tiny bit grubby. And, and that's about as far as they want to go with it. Because if you start having like really dark anti-heroes, I mean, even look at the awful Judge Dredd adaptation with Sylvester Stallone, where you have Stallone like proclaiming, I am the law, and everyone just laughs at him. Like when you watch that, it's just a laughable line. Yeah. But when you see um, Dredd, the, uh, the more modern one with, uh, Carl Urban, which was a fantastic yeah. film. In that, like, Dread, Dread isn't the hero. Like, he is brutal in it, and it's a very brutal film. And that's where you see the anti hero kind of done well, that they aren't yeah. slightly grubby heroes. They, they are anti heroes. They are something distinct to a hero who has a bit of smudging around the edges. 
But when we get to mainstream TV, like Legends of Tomorrow, yeah. they have Constantine um, as a recurring character for quite a lot of it. And oh yeah, he's a he's willing to. You're like, no, it, it's all a wee bit twee and a bit yeah. Um, no, it's subversive in its own way, and it's doing its own thing, and it's it's very very different to all of the other CW yeah. superhero shows. But look at the uh, Green Arrow when it first started. And you have Green Arrow. Look, what's he do? He has a kill list and he is going through the city murdering people. And you go, I'm sorry, I thought this was meant to be a superhero. What you this is a this is Dexter would be hunting this guy down. He is a serial killer. And then it's which 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 is what made it if it made it very interesting, right? I mean that that actually but but they tend to eventually and then it, right they 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 traject off they go they it's like a rubber band they 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 just snap back into the old mode you look at the 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 first uh michael keaton batman the the first tim burton batman yeah um if you look at the original script sam ham um when he's on the roof and the guys are the the two you know minor thugs that that have been stealing purses and stuff are talking about the bat and the legend yeah. of the bat um and he shows up and grabs one of them and holds him up right over the edge and in the original script it's one of the great lines of 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 comic book history the guy says <laughs> This is my time. You don't own the night. And Batman pulls him up and says, I am the night. The suits came in. They thought that was too dark <laughs> and they changed it. And so now we get the classic line, classic line, which is much less powerful. I'm Batman. Which, we know you're Batman. Everybody which is, knows you're Batman. They know you're Batman. Bat I'm Batman doesn't mean dick. We, which but has become like a running knight. joke. It's become a running joke everywhere. I'm Batman. Yes. I'm Batman. I'm but Spartacus. I am, but I am the knight. First of all, it's, it's a brilliant pun, but it's also I am darkness. I am the, the vampire that you've been talking about. I'm the bad guy that gets bad i'm the bad that the bad man fear which is the whole heart of the original batman story you know i will um uh, uh, thieves are a, a cowardly superstitious lot i will become a bat to scare them i mean that's 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 his whole raison d'etre that's that's how it begins the original three four page origin story and they 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 lose a little bit of that just right there in that moment, and then they again in the next, in the next, and the next until you get to God help us Schumacher, um, and we've got nipples in our suits and and flying surfboards. It, it just it it, it it becomes a parody of itself, and it's. I think it's really hard. First of all, I think it's hard to maintain the integrity of characters in a world that's so far off the norm. Yeah. And, and I think holding on to that and say like a, a even a series like The Expanse, it's really hard to keep the audience believing in that in that world because it continues to exist outside so far outside our own. But, but, but the weird thing about great, the, the great writers and the great directors managed to hold on to that for as long as they can. And so we get some really good stuff, but it, inevitably it kinds of, and that's why it has to keep being rebooted, yeah. you know, and, and, and resuited and, and recaped. <laughs> but also it doesn't matter how many times in film, uh, you know, Batman gets rid of the Joker. He, he will always come back because they'll just reboot it. And you sort of go, well, Stop killing them off at the end of films then. But that's why the comic books always just put them back in Arkham because you can always break out. But for some reason in the films, oh yeah, we'll just kill. we'll always kill them off. It's the only way to provide closure to the audience. You know, stop having your heroes kill people for a start. 
why can't he arrest him? Why can't he capture him and leave him for the cops so he could be put in jail like any decent hero would? It's like, no, 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 he needs to off him. Well, but we've 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 arrived at that that paradox, right? Because earlier we we're talking about why doesn't he just kill him, and now it's why doesn't he just arrest him? But that's 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 that scene on the top of the building in that that episode of the beginning of the second season of Daredevil. What's the difference between the hero and the vigilante? And we, we have these competing ideas. We we want to serve justice and put them away. We also just want to well fucking kill them yeah, so so I, what do we what do we do what what's what's the what's the right thing is it is incarceration and and rehabilitation or is it capital punishment what what what's and, what's and it right goes answer? back it goes back to the discussion we had uh, that we were talking about in terms of the hulk about the lizard brain and yes. almost like the mammalian brain um that our higher consciousness is all about they should be put in prison, rehabilitated, become members of society again. And the lizard brain part of us is, nah, kill him. We, we want, and it's always framed as we want justice. And you go, what does justice mean? Because justice is a winner's concept. You don't have two people going into court on, a, on opposing sides and the person losing coming out and going, ah, yep, yeah, justice was served today. Whoever wins says yeah. justice was served because it's about winning. It's not about the reasonable outcome. That's not justice. Uh, the it's reasonable like, outcome usually never pleases anyone. It's, it's people like us who get to talk about justice. It's the people who are on the dock or watching the person on the dock because they did something to them that, that don't discuss it in this way. We discuss it because we're outside that bubble, right? Yeah. Looking in, um, it's 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 hard inside the bubble, um, and and that's that's again the brilliance of Superman, Red Sun. He he arrives up in our our planet bubble. It's turned just slightly more, and he lands somewhere else, and the whole story changes. You know, he becomes the villain instead of the hero, and the and the. And the villain does become the hero, and so it it, it get, everything gets reversed, just because of a simple turn of the earth, just a few minutes. Um, can't say enough about that story. It's it's and it's a tiny, tiny little story that just it's amazing. I did huge impact like that. It, this is one of the things I love about what if stories taking a very tiny change and looking at the ramifications looking at the ripples because one small change at the start and suddenly you have something entirely different because the, the premise of that him landing in the ussr how does that fundamentally yeah. change superman and then the the extrapolation from that point is just so well played out um and it's a, it's a similar thing with with moon knight you know it's it's this, the simple thing is to say that it's, you know, as I said earlier, it's Marvel's version of Batman, but it's, 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 it's subtler than that. It's one minor, one minor change that, that, that the implied is, well, the latent is manifest, right? That, 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 that what we assume about Batman is actually true. So one, he's just a little bit crazier just just a little and what difference does that make well it, it it makes him he's the sociopath that he's fighting so it's it's not almost sociopath fighting sociopath it's sociopath fighting sociopath i'm really interested to see how they play this out in 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 uh, the the visual i mean the uh, filmed medium yeah but it's i mean if you think of the difference between professor x uh, Charles Xavier as over the, the different time periods that he's been portrayed where you know he's the the kindly uh, professor who has created this school and then he's well actually he's a Machiavellian sociopath who controls all of these kids and gets them to fight his wars for him as proxies well actually he's 
he's doing it for all the right reasons. Well, you know, it turned and it's constantly evolving the character and thinking about it because it, just the, the idea that he can go into people's heads and make them think and believe anything that he wants. That's a frightening superpower. And the, the uh, first season of Jessica Jones with the, the purple man uh, played extraordinarily well by David Tennant, who gives him yeah. such a level of sympathy that it is frightening that you're, you're looking at this truly evil person and not immediately condemning him. And the, the scene that always leaps to mind when I think about that particular show is when he's sitting in the coffee shop trying to compose the message and all of the noise in the background and he shut up, he just yells at them all to shut up. And of course they all have to, they have to follow the command. And he goes about typing. And I laughed because you know that feeling of when you're trying to work and people are having a conversation and you're like, would you just keep quiet while I do this? And you, you connect to him on a, such a human level and then immediately shy away from that because you know he's the bad guy. I, and it's, it's that conflict. And I think that's, for me, the power of superhero stories. Why, when uh, the, the MCU launched and after a couple of years, uh, I, I think it was by about Iron Man 2, there were articles coming out going, have we reached peak superhero? From uh. Iron Man 2, every single year, from Iron Man 2 onwards, there were articles about have we finally reached peak superhero? Yeah. And the, it is an endlessly fascinating genre for me because you can have horror, science fiction, fantasy, superhero stories because superhero is just a device within it and it's what you do with it. And you can ask, as some of the great authors have done, really complex interesting questions and put them in challenging stories well, and it doesn't have to be the overly saccharine um save the cat style story beat that is being peddled yeah i mean i, I love I, I simply adore the idea that michael shaban wrote um cavalier and clay which won the Pulitzer Prize um, only so that he would get a big enough name that he could slum it and start writing for comic books. <laughs> I, I, that, that, that just makes me happy that he, he hasn't really written, he's written one other novel since Cavalier and Clay, but he's written, I don't know how many comic books and screenplays and, and, and gone in as a script doctor for, for superhero films. He's he's living the life that he, we know he wanted. That's what he wanted. He didn't care about the freaking Pulitzer Prize. He wanted to write comic books. <laughs> and so he writes one of the great novels of all time and uses that to parlay himself into writing comics. I, I, I just find that brilliant. Yeah, but it, and, and, even... and just for a moment back to back Professor X, that that you know, talking about, you know, what is he? Is he Machiavellian? Is he hero? What it, well, those scenes between him and Magneto, it, you know, in the, in, the, in the plastic room playing chess, it speaks to exactly that issue. Are, are they the same person? One happens to be in a wheelchair. That's, that may be the only difference. Well, I, I, and I, I thought this was always interesting about how they were depicted, where Magneto was always depicted as physically powerful. And then you, you had that um, contrast because Xavier was always in the chair and about the, uh, the mental part. But of course, like Magneto is not a dumb brute. Um, but what was, I think, fascinating about a lot of the, the, the X-Men films and I, I quite liked a lot of X-Men First Class. Um, I thought a lot of that was actually quite a good movie. But the, the overwhelming focus, again, of trying to take 
something that's quite complex. And uh, because we see it in the comic books, we see it in the actual sort of literature, complex storylines that get told. We're, you know, talking about the Morlocks, um, even uh, the, the Iron Man storyline where about his alcoholism, the Daredevil storyline where he becomes corrupted. Like there are all of these fantastic storylines in the comics, but when it comes to the adaptations, when it comes to the yeah. film versions, it's no, but we want them to be a hero, but we want them to be gritty, but they still have to be the hero. We want bad guys. Let's do we need to make the bad guys? No, no, just make them a villain. And you know, sometimes they, productive. Some, sometimes they, they get it right. I mean, Blade got it right, right at the beginning. Um, and then more recently, Logan gets it right. Because, because Wolverine has never, I mean, he's, I mean, there's a reason why there's this fake um, hysterical um, conflict between uh, Wolverine and, and Deadpool the actors you know they 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 back and forth back and forth because they're really the same character um there there's no difference between wolverine and 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 deadpool wolverine kills people he well kills deadpool people has a comics. sense of humor about it yeah he kills people in the comics he kills people in the movies he kills people i mean ridiculously kills people in 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 the in logan you know his his last film um They'll bring him back, um, but but I mean, there's there's a scene. One of my favorite scenes in in X Men, which is one of the reasons why I started collecting it, is you know he's he's got the the claws and and he he has a guy up against the wall and he's popped out two of his claws on either side of the guy's neck and he's got the third one still in his hand and he says, "I'm going to give you to the count of five to tell me where somebody is." And I think it's probably. Gene Gray or something, and and he says the guy says I don't believe you. he says one, four. <laughs> he just skips two and three. That's that's Wolverine, and and he actually does kill people constantly. So we we get a film like Logan where that happens, and it's and it's it's brilliant. Um, and 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 honestly, Batman Returns. Batman kills a bunch of people right at the beginning when the when the the crew show up, the the, the circus people. Um, he he takes a, a a bundle of dynamite, straps it to one of the clowns' chest, pushes him off a, a a walkway, and the guy blows up. I mean, you don't come back from a, a dynamite strapped to your chest. I'm sorry. Um, so, I mean, he's he's killing people all over the place at the beginning. Um, and, and it's, you know, we sometimes think that the darkness of superheroes is this modern, gritty sort of movement. You know, a lot of it's been there for a long time. Um, the, it, it sort of goes in these mini trends and these micro uh, trends and these sort of movements within it. And then it's a, one will rise to prominence and then fade away. I, yeah. Brian, I, I hate to, to cut this short, but it started to get very lit here for me. Okay. Um, so, like, thank you very much for, for taking you. all of this time. Like, this has been a whole load of fun for me. Uh, maybe we can do it again sometime, but I just wanted to thank you so much for, for coming on and doing this. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, this is delightful. It's wonderful. <laughs> But this is what we do when we get together anyways. We sit and argue about this stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for watching. And for those of you uh, still watching, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And we will see you in the next one.